Welcome to PCN In-Depth. I'm Julie Thompson, your host, and this month we're focusing on the drug epidemic on the South Shore. We'll hear from experts, people dealing with addiction, and family members impacted by addiction. We will also visit the Plymouth County Drug Court. Opiate use has skyrocketed in our state and on the South Shore, resulting in an increase in overdose-related deaths. In 2009, Massachusetts set up a commission to conduct research on this public health crisis. Studies tell us that the opiate addiction rate increased by 950 percent between 2002 and 2007. During this five-year time period, over 3,000 residents died as a result of opiate-related overdoses. Sadly, these rates continue to grow. We recently have had the opportunity to speak with several people dealing with addiction. In this video, they share with us their stories. Probably like 15, I started drinking and smoking pot and um, I used a lot of cocaine and yeah, I experimented with a lot of drugs growing up. I'm not sure really what triggered it, but I started using, uh, you know, like smoking weed and drinking probably at a young age, probably around like 12 or something. I didn't start out with heavy drugs, it started out like a lot of people, marijuana drinking and... I think there's a sense among a lot of young folks that it isn't dangerous, that they can get away with it, that they can do it and they can stop. The kids aren't starting with alcohol, they're starting with the pills. We're really fighting the war against prescribed drugs. Individuals get addicted without realizing how quickly it can happen. Eventually by the time I was like 20, I turned to Percocet and stuff like that, harder drugs. You know, over the course of time, I found myself falling into heavier things and, you know, with the wrong crowd and making the wrong choices. It happens out of the medicine cabinet. It happens um, on the soccer field when people have a, a sports injury. It doesn't always happen. And p kids don't start out saying, I want to be a heroin addict when I grow up. In this day and age, you have to be 18 to buy cigarettes, 21 to buy alcohol, but you could be prescribed a narcotic from your doctor and walk around with that script. You know, growing up I had a good childhood, I grew up in a good family, had anything I could have wanted, you know, supportive parents, loving, caring. Certainly people are utilizing opiate pills more than they ever did before. Um, <clears throat> going in to have a back surgery or a tooth extracted or a shoulder surgery, any kind of treatment, you're going to probably come out with some type of a prescription for that. Well at first I was uh, prescribed a lot of pills for, from injuries in the past and then uh, after that, I just started buying them on the street. You know, over a matter of years, it was from partying to, you know, full-blown addiction. When they engineered OxyContin so that they could not um, tamper with the time release, then the population just shifted to Percocets. So the Percocets are now um, the gateway to heroin. Unfortunately, in this area, drugs are um, prevalent, and heroin is unbelievable epidemic in this area among every walk of life. We see that this has now spanned all socioeconomic classes. This has spanned through all kinds of families, um, lawyers, doctors, bankers, senators, representatives, teachers, judges. Nobody is exempt from this. People don't think that it happens in the Hingham's and Cohasset's and Situates and Plymouth in those kind of areas, but it does. It happens everywhere. Nobody wakes up wanting to be an addict. Uh, nobody starts off saying, I'm going to take this bottle of pills and then I'm going to be on that, that slippery slope to heroin. Uh, it's a gradual process, but then once it gets a hold of you, it definitely gets a hold of you. But the minute you start putting that needle in your arm, you know that you're on a shaky road. Yeah, I started doing heroin probably when I was like 21. And uh, just a downward spiral from there. Um, it got to be really expensive doing Percocets. So after I had my daughter, like and a lot of people I was buying them from weren't really getting them as much. And they were switching over to selling heroin. And I avoided switching over to heroin for as long as I could. And I eventually gave in one day when I couldn't find any Percocets. And I knew that I could find heroin. I knew that would make me not sick anymore. A heroin is about three dollars for a hit, so it's about the, the cost of a cup of coffee. While the price of bread and milk has gone up, the price of heroin has gone down. And the lethality of the heroin that we have is causing, um, is causing significant overdoses and significant health risks. 
Sadly, these stories are all too common. I am joined now by Dr. Joseph Schrand, who, among other things, is an author, an instructor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and the medical director of CASEL, an intervention unit for at-risk teens at High Point Treatment Center. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. It's nice to be here. You have been in this um, field and had experience in the, this addiction um, for many, many, many years. Yeah. Talk to us about what we need to know. Sure. You know, I, I think that previous clip was really important. Did you hear how young those kids were when they started? Yeah. This is a critical piece of information. If you start using drugs or alcohol after the age of 21, one out of 25 people are at risk for lifelong addiction. But if you start using before the age of 18, and all those folks did, that number goes from 1 in 25 to 1 in 4. Wow. I mean, that is a wow number. Right. It really is, you know. Uh, that's why it's so important for us to get these kids early to try to treat them, because it's a risk, not a done deal. So what's going on in this brain? This brain is exposed to a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is a very simple chemical. I think we may have a picture of it. Do we have a picture of it? Yeah, That's we have great. A slide. Great. Yep. And you can see it's it's incredibly simple, right. which really implies it has traveled with us as a companion in our evolution for probably a billion years or so. Okay. It is the chemical of pleasure. All drugs and alcohol force the brain to release dopamine. And look, it would be silly to think that these drugs and alcohol weren't pleasurable. Right. right? right. That's why they're addictive. So right. you go, the brain goes, whoa. That was good. I want to do that again. Okay. So dopamine? Dopamine. Okay. But the problem is there is another chemical of pleasure. It's a much more complicated one. You can see it. It's called oxytocin, not oxycontin. Okay. Oxytocin. That is complicated. Right? Yeah. But this is the chemical of trust. This is the chemical that is released when somebody says, Julie, this is one of the best shows I've ever seen. And you get that rush? Right, right. That's oxytocin. Okay. Very yeah. important part of how we bind to each other, bond with each other okay. as human beings. Dopamine interferes with it. So just think about this. Dopamine interferes with oxytocin. Drugs and alcohol interfere with trust, which means when you're using drugs or alcohol, you're having an effect on somebody else's brain. Okay. And that's powerful stuff. Uh, I hate to say it, how many heroin addicts do you trust? Now this leads to the stigma right. of addiction because human beings want to be able to trust other human beings. So the stigma of addiction is because we lose this connection with the folks that need us the most. Right. Because we've got to be able to bring them back in. Now in my program, Castle, I work with adolescents. You know, I've got 13-year-olds addicted to heroin. But all we're trying to do there is rekindle their sense of value. Respect is the key to that. Respect leads to value, and value leads to trust, and trust is oxytocin. Okay. So when I started the program in 2008, that's what I thought, let's try this. Let's not judge these kids. Let's respect them, value them, and see what happens, and it works. It's really working because these kids then begin to trust us and they can explore why they're using drugs or alcohol. This is really the key for folks. If you can begin to feel valued and trusted, you can step back mm -hmm. and look at why you're doing what you're doing without that judgment. Mm -hmm. Critical, critical. And then in 2011, I'm very pleased to say a, an article came out. It wasn't my article, but one of my colleagues. And the title was Oxytocin Breaks the Loop of Addiction. Mm -hmm. So, I know it may sound sort of silly, but that's how we can help folks. There are dozens and dozens of treatment modalities. Some of them work better than others. But the bottom line of all of them is a person feels connected to someone else. That's what AA is about. Mm -hmm. They call it a fellowship mm -hmm. for a reason. Okay. Now, dopamine, you can only get... The dopamine only reacts to things like alcohol and drugs? Now, unfortunately, it's much more ubiquitous than that. So okay. because it's so ancient, yeah. it has many, many different functions okay. in our body. But okay. one of them certainly is this very, very compelling uh, pleasure and addiction. Okay. Once a person is in treatment for addiction, um, like in your, your programs with the, with the youth, how do you, how do you keep them 
from sliding back? What are their triggers? How do, how do you take each individual kid and say, let's look at you, let's see how this won't happen again to you? Well, what we do at, at Castle is we use something called the I am approach that I've developed since 1982, which is saying this is who I am. Okay. I'm always doing the best I can at this moment based on the influence of four domains. Our home domain, yeah. our social domain, the way I see myself and the way I think you see me, and our biology, our brain and our body. Okay. So memory is a trigger, right? So triggers have to imply memory. Mm -hmm. It's not a coincidence that memory lives in the same part of the brain that addictions do. Right. right? It's all connected. It's all connected. Right. But what we're trying to do is shift these kids back into another part of their brain, our prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that's right behind your forehead. Mm -hmm. This is the thinking part. This is the part that allows you to solve a problem and to anticipate the consequence of that solution. That part of the brain is actually relatively less mature in adolescence mm -hmm. than the part of the brain that's running the addictions. Okay. How do we as a society help with this incredibly prevalent problem now? What, what do we lay people do? The first thing, oh. sorry about that, the, okay. the first thing is to, we've got to get over the stigma. Okay. Right? No stigma. Yep. There are 20 million kids in the United States that are at risk for addiction mm -hmm. or are not addicted. There are many, many more adults than that. Only 10% of them seek treatment. Okay. And that's because people will say, what, what are you doing here? You're a drug addict. Get out of here. Right. So that's the first thing. Remember, you can hate the addiction but not the addict. Right. Don't hate the person. Critical, critical. Right. First step. Right. Bring them back in. And then remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Right. This is going to take a long time Thanks. because you've got a brain that is now conditioned. Right. Whenever I feel something, anger, sadness, anxiety, I'm going to use a drug to get away from that feeling. Right. And then you actually begin creating the very feelings that you're trying to get away from. Okay. Because so it's being aware, awareness. Um. And get them into treatment. Don't be afraid. Right. You know, don't be afraid to call them on it. Okay. Say, hey, I think something's going on. Right. You know, not out of judgment, but right. because I care about you. Okay. Right. All right. Well, w there's so much more that we could talk about. And um, we've put some information at the end of the show on our on our uh, screen so people can go to different places to get help and get more information. And I have to thank you so much for joining us today. I wish we had more time because I could talk to you forever. But thank you for uh, bringing a little bit more light into the, the clinical understanding of this whole problem. We appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. There is a correlation between increased drug use and increased crime rates. In order to more effectively treat people in the criminal system who are dealing with addiction, Massachusetts has responded by implementing drug courts. These courts allow judges to place nonviolent offenders with addiction issues into more treatment-centered programs. They work closely with the local probation departments to set strict guidelines for the offender while offering intensive treatment for their addiction. The Plymouth County Drug Court opened in 2010 and is presided over by esteemed Justice Rosemary Minahan. We need to take a look at education, prevention, intervention, and treatment. And those are the four components to, to dealing with substance abuse recovery. Plymouth began a drug court session back in 2010 as a result of what we saw was an increase in the number of opiate overdoses and just the uh, volume of addiction in the South Shore. Is you need to be eligible to go into drug court, so not everyone is eligible to participate in the drug court program. And part of your so-called sentencing is treatment, whether it be meetings, whether it be residential treatment, um, having drug screens, and really participating in your recovery while at the same time facing the penalties for possible crimes that you have committed. The Office of Community Corrections in conjunction with probation, it's all one entity, but we work together to make sure that the person has the right level of supervision. Probation works with the police department and the community correction center and the agencies to kind of have that um, blanket, of, uh, blanket approach over everything to make sure that everyone is protected and that we can actually um, serve these people and help them recover. Because our goal isn't to send people to the House of Correction, our goal is to rehabilitate. 
It's a very tough program. They, they have very rigid and strict structure and they expect a lot from you and you're held accountable for everything. You're tested several times a week, drug testing and um, community service regularly. You go classes three, four times a week and uh, if you don't abide by their guidelines and do what they expect, then they don't put up with it and you, you, know, you go back to jail. In traditional courts, you go in front of the judge and you stand there in front of a judge and you just get sentenced and then you're whisked away. Whereas in a drug court, there's a, um, a, a more familiar relationship with the judge that you can have this conversation with the judge and you can, the judge will talk to you and reinforce you. Where You don't see that in, or I never saw that before in the traditional sense. Judges who participate in drug courts really have to ha have that balance between a lot of compassion and a lot of accountability. I think she's a good judge. She uh, tries to get people to straighten up and uh, not have to go to jail. I've been going to the drug court for like maybe two months now, just about, and um, she's she cares a lot about the um, people that she <clears throat> is overseeing. Like you can tell, she actually cares about seeing us do good, and she gives us um, praise when you know you need to hear it, and she gives you know tough love when you need it too. Like she does lock you up real quick if you mess up, and. Like I've seen her like say to people like you know I just don't want to see you die out there and I think that's really all I think that's really what she cares about she just I think she's taking a proactive look at it in action I think she's doing what she has to do but I think she's also been going out of her way for us because I think um, I think she really cares and the recidivism rate is significantly lower. Um, significantly lower for those involved in drug courts, not only in Plymouth, but across the state and the country. Um, I think the preliminary results were um, that uh, the recidivism rate for non-participating defendants similarly situated in drug offenses is about 51 percent in the first six months will either commit a new crime or have a violation of probation. They'll fail in some probationary term. And in the drug court, it was about 6 percent. So something's going right. Clearly, the intensified treatments that Judge Minahan referred to have been very effective. But how can we as family members, loved ones, and communities be proactive? How can we stop addiction before it happens? How can we recognize the signs of addiction, or can we? I would like to warmly welcome my next guest, Kelly Pucko, who lost her sister, Alicia, to an overdose two years ago when she was just 23. We welcome her. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Kelly. Talk about Alicia. Um, so my little sister was really funny. She loved to have fun. Um, she was a little fashionista. She loved clothes and shopping. I think anyone who knows her would, would know that fact about her. Um, she had nicknames for everyone. Um, family, friends, her social life, those were like the most important things in her life. She, if she loved you, she, you knew it. Um, she had a great way of just showing everyone how much she cared about them. Um, for work, she worked with special needs adults most recently before she passed, um, and she just had a passion for that. She was so amazing at working with that population. She worked with children of the same population, and just you could see her caring and compassion um, in everything that she did, and that was kind of her goal was to, to stay in that field and continue to pursue education and training in that. Um, so she went to school for that? Yeah, she did a little bit of um, community college for that, but that was something she started in high school with just a little bit of babysitting and it turned into something big for her. She sounds wonderful. Now talk to me about secrecy where there's so many people that become addicted and their families, their loved ones, their closest friends have no idea. Explain your situation, how that happened with Alicia. Um, so I think with substance abuse more in more recent times, um, there's not always a smell or a paraphernalia associated with it. Um, it can be something as small as a pill bottle that's easy to hide and doesn't always look strange in every situation. And I think there's not always a sign to look for. Um, substance abuse happens to everyone from every type of family. So I think it's hard to kind of discover who, who they're hanging out with and using that as a cue or just things that they're doing. and. Most recently, I noticed that these people are functioning. They're going to work. They're living their life. And you don't notice things like, oh, they miss school, they miss work, when they're still a functioning adult and a functioning human. And you just, you don't realize that there's a problem because day to day they seem like everything's going okay. 
Um, and I think for the user, it's that fear of getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. I think our first reaction to finding out about that or something like that is to punish, um, mm -hmm. for parents to ground their children or for you know law enforcement to, to give a punishment. Um, so I think it's, it's hard to pinpoint how to deal with that and it's so, to, to keep it so secret um, right. is easier. So how did, how did Alicia hide this from you and how long do you think she was using drugs before you as a family member found out? Um, I found out because she told me. Um, she got stuck in a situation and just kind of came clean to all of us. And I think that was the hardest part to be like, how did I not know? How did I not see this coming? What was I missing? And I think in hindsight, you sort of see the little signs, but that whole functioning and day to day and you just you just don't see that there's a bigger problem. Right, so none of her friends, her coworkers, no one you know, had an idea. No, and she was so happy. She had had some losses in her life that I think led to that substance abuse and drug addiction. And I think you see a person change and I'm like, well, she's so happy. She has this and that. And you don't realize there's an underlying issue. Right. Um, now, drug abuse itself has a stigma. Uh, people think, oh boy, people that are addicted to drugs, you know, there must be something wrong with them or it's, it's not fair. And I know right. you wanted to talk about that and speak to that whole issue. Um, I think now there is a huge stigma associated with drug abuse. Um, and there's also from all ends, from the user, from their family, their friends, there's a big sense of shame and guilt um, for maybe for the parent. It's like, what did I do wrong that you know, my child is now using drugs. But I think that speaks to also the secrecy is they come from all walks of life. You don't, there's no lifestyle or family that someone grew up in that you, oh, they're going to become addicted to drugs. I think it's just so hard to like change that stigma. Right. And there's so much judgment from other people. Nobody just comes out and says, oh, my child is addicted to drugs because right. they know there's so much judgment coming at them. Do, um, do you think it's getting better though with so much more education, so much more involvement with the community, with schools, with parents, with groups that are forming? Yep, I think it's one of those things you can change. You feel like, how can we change society as a whole? But it's, it's in the individual. It's like, you know, in this conversation and just spreading that message of it's okay, it's not their fault, it's right. not, not something they intended to do. It happens. Um, and it, it does, it just happens. Right. If Alicia were here, what would she say? Um, I think she would say that it's an accident. It was an accident. Um, people don't get addicted to drugs on purpose. Nobody tries something with the intention of becoming addicted and you know ruining things in their life. And I think just not giving up on those people and knowing that at one point or another, it's not them making the decisions. It's not that person you think you knew, it's their body. and their brain making those hard decisions for them and just stay, sticking by them, really, and right. it's okay. Right. Thank you. Um, she spoke through you, and because of her, you're here, and you're carrying on her work. I know you've joined an organization, and I, I know this is a pa passion in your life, yes. and we appreciate so much you sharing that with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. There is hope for people and families who are dealing with addiction. At the end of the show, we'll share some local resources with you, and we would like to end the episode talking about the early signs of addiction that we can watch for, and hopeful messages of people in recovery and those who help them get there. Thank you for joining us. Some of the things that parents, I think, should look for is changes in behaviors um, with their children as to whether or not that person's um, weight has changed, whether or not they're nodding off, whether or not they have um, their eye coloring um, underneath their eyes have turned to a darkish color, just their even social, are they not hanging around with the same group of people that they've been hanging around with, are they, they not as receptive to talking, just changes in their general behavior. These are just signs that say something's going on, you know, uh, ask those questions, be involved in your kid's life. Taking time, even just the little thing of having dinner with your kids and asking the questions goes a long way. First thing I would encourage any parent to do is to go into the medicine cabinet and eliminate all of the drugs in the cabinet that you are not using. They're just leaving a pharmacy that's unlocked in the medicine cabinet and that is where a lot of this addiction begins. Parents think, oh, it's not going to happen to my kid. And parents really need to be aware and look for the signs that something's going on, something's changing. My, my child doesn't look the same. My child's not acting the same. 
So I would say that there is hope, and I would say to parents who are terrified, you know, that the, um, that the court, uh, this court in particular, and I think courts across the state, are responding. Every time I've gone into treatment, I've like chosen to do further care here and there, but on some occasions it was because I had to to please like DCF or my parents. And like when you're doing it, you really got to do it for yourself. I, I like to say, and I believe, that it has to do with the work of those that are in the system and also that the hard work of the individuals who are participating who want to get sober. That's really our goal, is to get them back to the world where they have now developed new skill sets to stay sober um, and understand what's their, what their triggers are, what causes addiction in the first place. I think anybody's eligible for addiction. You don't have to grow up in a poor, t poor town or grow up in a bad family. It's the choices that I made that led me here. And only I myself can choose to do the right thing. Once you get it in your head that you, you need to stop and want to stop, I think it's, it's really up to you, but programs do help a lot. If you do get into it, there is a way out of it too. Once they're away from the drug for a while, they want to stop. You take small steps and like eventually it will lead to bigger steps. I'm trying this time. Nothing gets better if you keep using and it just, every relapse just gets worse. And my family's um, been through a lot with me. It doesn't take a long time to like rebuild trust with my family and you lose a lot of, you lose the people that really do care about you. I mean, they'd rather definitely have seen me go down a different path, but they, they are sticking by me for now. And I mean, but I can always, I know I can always still lose that. Like, there's only so many chances you get. In my final word, I would say not to lose hope and loved ones, not to lose hope that there is hope, that people do get better, um, and, then, and, then they, and then they help other people because that is very important. This is a long journey um, and they, it, it, we're in for the long haul and we hope the courts are a front and center player in recovery.